Uh, I need to start by saying I'm at NIST as a contractor from Strativia. Uh, thanks, Yolan, for inviting. I also want to say that this is an impromptu uh, presentation. The invitation came, uh, I don't know, yesterday or two days ago. And, you know, so that's my excuse in case I kind of go over time a little bit. So um, this presentation will be somewhat different from the previous ones in, in the sense that I won't go into um, the goal is not to go into many technicalities, although I'll mention a few technical details, but it's more to present uh, 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 the NIST project on uh, randomness beacons and some of our uh, perspectives. Okay, so let me start with an introduction. So um, what NIST sees as a randomness beacon since uh, around 2011, as it, start, as it tried to to define what it wanted to, to promote as uh, public randomness uh, for public good is that it should be a service that promotes, uh, that produces timed output, so they're, they're uh, well defined in time, of fresh public randomness. So a lot of keywords here. So at a high level description, if you look at these uh, uh, words in blue, these are some properties that we want. So we want some per periodicity. Um, uh, to produce what we call pulses, like the, the streams of information that contain some randomness. In the case of the NIST beacon implementation, these are once per minute. Uh, each pulse needs to have a certain amount of uh, randomness, which the NIST beacon, for example, has 512 bits of. Um, each pulse needs to be indexed so that we know exactly what we're talking about. There's no ambiguity. Uh, it's indexed in terms of timestamps, and uh, uh, it needs to be signed as well. Um, any past pulse needs to be publicly accessible forever. Uh, and also the sequence of pulses should should form a hash chain so that somehow we can keep uh, a well-defined history and sequence. Uh, now, what is this good for and maybe not good for? Well, broadly speaking, we, we think of um, a main application is to enable public auditability of randomized processes. So whenever randomization needs to be used but later needs to be verified, it's nice to have a service that allows that to be done. It allows for coordination between many parties and uh, it also allows to prove that something has happened after a certain amount of time if you trust that a particular pulse did occur in the time that it uh, that it shows, that it's timestamped for. Uh, and we always like to give the the little disclaimer that this is not good for selecting public keys. Uh, even though, you know, the randomness is supposed to be the best quality possible, uh, it should only be used for certain uh, use cases. Um, this is, would typically be a slide like to be maybe in the end of the presentation, but because I'm kind of afraid of <laughs> not getting there, I just thought of putting it here. Um, uh, also, to give a note that I think actually working on applications of public randomness is actually something that would be very nice for this community overall to work on because I, this is we're, we're not there yet I believe uh, but anyway here are some examples of conceivable applications that have been thought of uh, across time so for example for clinical trials you know somebody makes a study you need to have some randomization in it to make sure the study is good then you have super good results or maybe bad results you know people can ask, oh, did you really use randomness or did you kind of cook uh, the results in your favor? So, you know, if you have public verifiable randomness, that can be used for this. Um, we've thought of applications of legal metrology where, for example, certain instruments need to be verified and using public randomness can, you know, make a, a um, can basically insert uh, a verifiable timestamp uh, in, in applications that need randomness. Uh, financial audits, for example, this is an application suggested by the Chilean Beacon uh, uh, team whereby in, in Chile supposedly there's a, a process whereby public officials need to be selected for, to be audited. Um, and you know, if it happens that you select people that somehow have a, a, a um, you know, it, it can be sensitive, the people you are selecting, right? So it's good to show that this is being properly done. Uh, imagine, for example, in a, in, a, in a legal system, you want to select judges to, to, be, uh, to be in particular court cases. You could use a public randomness beacon for that. And then many applications of uh, quality control uh, to basically select what are the samples you should audit and things like that. Uh, some historical notes about the... the, the um, the project at NIST, by the way, I've, I've been at NIST since 2017, so a lot of this is prior to my arrival there, although I visited in 2012. Uh, so in 2011 was the start of the Beacon uh, project, basically based on the idea that 
public randomness should be a, a resource for the public good. Uh, in 2012, there was like an in a big internal grant that allowed NIST to produce, to have this project for implementing a NIST beacon, and also to do research in physics to actually develop uh, quantum random number generators. Um, between 2013 and 18, there was a beacon service, the, uh, dubbed one version 1.0. Uh, 2015, there was a nice, uh, interesting research result by the physical measurements lab that uh, validated Bell a loophole free inequalities. Uh, kind of has to do with causality. Uh, it's interesting for, uh, uh, with respect to randomness. In 2018, we kind of started a new uh, uh, phase of the project. Um, uh, also around that time, the physics, physics measurement labs actually developed an in-house quantum random number generator, which today is implemented uh, in the NIST beacon. Uh, and until present, we have version 2.0 online. And since 2019, there's a, there's a reference for randomness beacon, which basically is the topic of, uh, it's the main topic of today's uh, uh, talk. And uh, we're hoping this year, this has been in draft version for quite a while, but this year we should have the final version of this draft published, so no longer a draft, and also publish the open source code of the NIST beacon. Um, I also want to mention th uh, that in 2019 we decided to uh, uh, be more clear about different tracks of the project, uh, so that the project is not confused just with the NIST beacon. So the NIST beacon, the NIST randomness beacon is an implementation of this reference, that's what is here as track B, but as track A we want to promote a reference for randomness beacon that other beacons can use. Um, in particular, by the way, I, I actually wanted to mention this in the in the cover slide. Uh, also, uh, an aspect uh, of this presentation that is different from the others is that we're not here presenting a decentralized system. We're actually presenting a randomness beacon that is centralized. But the vision is that this is used. Oops. But the vision is that this is used in an ecosystem with many beacons, and so that's you know it's like a, an ad hoc decentralization. Um, so we want to, as Track C, we want to promote deployment of uh, various beacons by multiple independent organizations. And currently, there's one in the U.S., which is at NIST. There's one in Brazil, by in Metro, uh, and there's one in Chile. Uh, we would like to promote applications of beacon issued randomness. A lot needs to be done here. Uh, and there, we also support complementary initiatives about trusted randomness. Let me just give an example that I think is really interesting. Um, you can use uh, quantum supremacy to enable certified randomness, which is really a very counterintuitive uh, um, concept. So you can have randomness that you can prove that has been freshly sampled, and you can base that on... Uh, on quantum supremacy, as long as you can prove, if you have a little seed that you know, if you have a little seed, you can use it in a quantum computation such that what comes out of that, you can prove that it has been sampled after you had that seed. Really nice concept. Uh, maybe someday we'll have a beacon with this uh, type of uh, publicly certifiable randomness. Okay, I'm already spending too much time here. Okay, beacon reference. So there's a, there's a report, you can check it online. It defines a format for the pulses how a beacon should operate internally, um, how you can use the fields of the, of the pulse to have a proper use of randomness, and it has some security considerations, and the final version will be published this year. How, do you, uh, how does this work? Well, there's a beacon, what we call a beacon app, that you know, has all the internals inside, and then timely produces pulses, it posts them to a, to a database, and then users, whenever they want, they go there and they fetch pulses, the li latest one or old ones. How do they do that? Well, there's, there's a, a REST interface where you can basically use a, a URL. Uh, you can use different URLs to get different elements, uh, uh, you know, past pulses or the current pulse or the certificate or something like that. Um, all of this is explained in the, in the reference document. Uh, here's, let me just, I guess, point out a few, uh, a few items here. So does this have any laser? I guess not. Um, just to point out a few aspects. So, oh, Cool, I have this here. So um, the, the reference for randomness beacons specifies that the, the local randomness for each pulse needs to include at least randomness from two RNGs. So there's one that is local to the beacon app. Imagine this basically as a computer, which also has a clock. Uh, we, we recommend that the, a second RNG needs, should be outside and, and uh, protected, uh, so not, not within reach of, uh, of tampering by the beacon app itself if it were to be uh, hacked. Uh, the signing mechanism should also be uh, protected. You can use multiple RNGs. Uh, 
you can use external entropy. This is an interesting aspect. This external entropy is not for the purpose of improving the entropy of a pulse, but it's more to provide an assurance of freshness. So every time you put in uh, external entropy that can be verified in the, in the external world, you know that it's impossible that whatever randomness comes out of it, uh, out, uh, after it, had been pre-computed by, by even a malicious beacon. That's because we have chained uh, uh, randomness. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then, of course, we need to have a time server. And then we, when we make con security considerations, there's a number of things we want to consider. What happens if this part is malicious, but this one is protected? What happens if the time server is malicious? What happens uh, uh, if, the si if the signature key is compromised, etc.? Okay, what is a pulse exactly? Well, uh, a pulse has many uh, items. And uh, in the interest of time, I can't explain them all. Let me just mention the you know, the essential parts of randomness. There's actually two uh, fields that we called rand something. And there's what we call a local random value that is uh, sampled, uh, you know, it's the hash of at least uh, the outputs of two RNGs. And it's pre-committed one minute in advance of being released. So it's pre-committed in a pulse before the, the actual value is released in the next pulse. The reason for doing this, this is a feature of, of version 2 as compared to version 1, is that this is, this is one of the features that allows to combine randomness from different beacons. Essentially, you can use this to do a kind of typical coin flipping protocol. You, you, s you, you pick several beacons, you get their pre-commitments, and once you have all of them, you can you can safely use the randomness that they reveal after the fact because you know none of the, at least any honest beacon could have not been, any malicious beacon could not have waited to know what's the randomness of the honest beacon because we're doing like this two stage uh, process. Then we actually have the actual random output value um, which um, is a hash of all other fields that include, you know, the signature, timestamps, uh, indices, etc. And it's fresh at time of release. Actually it's, it's uh, it's, a, it's fresh within seconds because uh, when you prick, even though the random local value that is going to show is from a minute before, it also hashes the pre-commitment of the next local random value, which was just selected. So this is fresh, uh, and this is the actual randomness that should be used by applications. Um, let's see. Uh, could you tell me how much time I have just so to see how, what should I skip? Okay, perfect. Um, so how does this work, more or less, you know, with a lot of details here hidden in the, in the ellipsis? So we have a local random value that is the hash of various uh, what we call raw random values, you know, either t at least two uh, RNGs, but possibly more. Uh, then you pre-commit it. It's like the CI you have here. So on pulse I, you have a pre-commitment of, of what you're going to reveal in the next pulse as local random value. And then the actual random output in uh, a pulse i is the hash of everything that is over here. And then you, you have these relations. So, there, oh, yeah, something also relevant in the per from the perspective of hash chaining is that the, the random output value of a pulse is actually then also included in the next pulse as in the field the output of the previous pulse. And this is what allows us to have some chaining. Um, yeah, again, there's this little relation here as well. Um, yeah, so this pretty much gives you uh, a little insight to how the random values appear in pulses. Uh, here's a, a little snippet of a pulse. Uh, as I mentioned, each pulse is indexed with an index, with a version. Uh, there's a URI. There's the time. There's Here are the two, loc two random values that I just spoke about. Uh, here's the signature value, the pre-commitment, uh, and here is the the, the output value of the previous pulse, and then actually we have an output value of the previous hour, of the previous month, of the previous year, to actually allow uh, what we call a skip list, which is an efficient uh, chaining of pulses. Okay, some features of uh, version 2. This is what, in a bigger presentation, each of these elements would be a slide. So a skip list is what I just mentioned. You can actually check correct chaining between pulses. By correct, we mean that there's only a possible, there's a single possible history between two pulses, you can use an efficient skip list even if they're separated uh, millions of pulses apart because you can go the first of the hour, the first of the month, the first of the year, then you go one year at a time and then you connect back to the other pulse. Uh, combining beacons, as I mentioned, you can do coin flipping, uh, kind of a coin flipping protocol using the pre-commitments of various pulses. Uh, the reference specifies various timing requirements, some of which we call promises, you know, like a pulse uh, we, we pr the beacon operator promises that a pulse will not be released 
uh, before uh, its timestamp. Uh, it will also it will not be generated less than a minute before its timestamp and things like that. Um, there's a beacon interface in the reference that specifies how you can get all the information from the beacon. This is actually one of the things that has led the the, the beacon the the reference to take its time to be published. We're just finalizing that. Uh, external values. This is something interesting, maybe from the perspective of combining various beacons. So. A version two of the of this reference has a field to to incorporate external values, as I mentioned in in a previous figure. This allows to ensure freshness. So we can conceivably uh, insert in this field, let's say every hour or every day, or could also be every minute. But uh, uh, but let's say every day, we could actually let's say input a random value from the end, and that would show that even if the malicious the beacon is completely, if this beacon is completely broken, it could have not pre-computed in advance things beyond a day, right? We can kind of imagine here a cross-relation between many beacons that would ensure this to, to, to various beacons. Um, and then we recognize that future guidance is needed for some aspects of how to use a beacon, how to combine external values, etc. Okay, skip list. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the, <laughs> the example, but this was an example that basically shows, you know, instead of going a million consecutive pulses, you can kind of go... Uh, step by step, and just you know, in a hundred and few uh, pulses, you can combine any two. In, in a hundred or so steps, you can combine any two pulses, distanced apart. And as conclusion, just as final remarks, so you know, the 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 the, the Beacon project at NIST really arose out of believing that there's a great potential for public randomness to serve as a as a public auditability, such as for uh, public auditability of randomized processes. Uh, the reference that NIST developed uh, introduced new features for better interoperability, security, and efficiency. And its its vision is that there is an international ecosystem of randomness beacons. So uh, even though it's a centralized um, uh, proposal, it's for use within an ecosystem. Uh, further guidance and promotion is needed, and that's something to be done across time. Uh, external values are not yet used in, in the NIST randomness beacon, but as I mentioned, this is conceivable to be integrated with other randomness beacons. That I think that's an interesting uh, community conversation to have. And um, stay tuned for the soon-to-come uh, reference. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry, one thing I did not get it. Is it to be, uh, publicly verifiable or like... We need to ask what is publicly verifiable, the right? Yes. Right. So you can verify that. So uh, um, the randomness comes from RNGs, right? So it's right. not as in DRAND where you know, okay, this so comes directly from a, from a pseudo-random transformation. What you can publicly verify, you can verify all the hash chaining between pulses, and you can always check that the, the output value, the random output value that is proposed to be used by a by an application is indeed the hash of everything that is that is before, and it has been signed by by a private key. Right. So the first one is like kind of had to trust it, right? Come again. And the first one to start with the hash chain, right? So it's a sequence of hash chain, but there is an initial I don't know genesis or something. Yes. That uh, and that can be arbitrarily generated. Uh, but uh, as can all pulses. So this is a substantial difference with with DRAND, right? So DRAND is effectively not. It's actually deterministic, right? But, right, it's, right? but it's unpredictable. Here, the goal is that it's actually random every time. And for, for example, we use a quantum random number generator, et cetera. So there is that degree of trust that you right, need to have in a big So you are using that, that there is no verifiability of the fact that these things is being used. That's what I'm trying yes, to ask. Yes, yes. There is no verifiability, right? So kind of trust. Yes, okay. as, as in others as well, right? Because there's yeah, no verifiability sure, sure, sure. of a secret key. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, for example, just for the purpose of the secret key, in each pulse, you actually implement a PRF in a sense. I mean, uh, informally speaking, because you are effectively signing something yeah. with a key that is supposed to be... Signature you can verify, sure. But yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Get thank it. you. Um, so you mentioned you had a draft for a spec and everything. So is it really like specifying every step of the generation of the beacons? Or could we say, oh, we can transform DRAND into a compatible beacon by producing, you know, by using DRAND as a PRNG to the beacon and then just 
complying with the spec? So uh, I, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking because interoperability, I think, is a very interesting uh, concept in this domain. It depends at which level you're talking about interoperability. So the reference does specify a number of uh, you know operations. So effectively, the output random value is a hash of a well-specified sequence of of fields and things like that, right? And I, I don't think that, let's say, DRAN has those fields in those manners. But maybe that's not a, an issue because what matters more is like, okay, what is what is the actual output value? How would you, is it interoperable that we could use DRAN's external v output value in our external value to somehow have that interoperability? Uh, a little more concretely, something that I think could be interesting to talk about in terms of you know community interoperability would be, how do we uh, suggest, how do we provide guidance for a user that doesn't want to trust DRAN, doesn't want to trust any of these beacons, but is willing to trust the combination of them? What is the kind of guidance that we give to how they should combine things, right? So let's say, uh, first thought could be you know, insecure, but say, okay, no, just collect the randomness from everybody and hash it, right? But then, oh, okay, but what if that malicious party knows that's what you're doing, so they're gonna wait for all the others to reveal their randomness and then they're going to produce their own, right? So they could bias the randomness. We have this in this reference, the, the pre-commitment, exactly to uh, already facilitate that. I don't know if the, I, I don't think DRAN has that. Um, but Not we could yet. think of how to do it, yeah. <laughs> oh. Final one in the interest of time. Very, very quickly, um, is all very nice, but why are you doing this? Like, what's the interest of NIST of uh, having this effort on run as beacon? Yeah, so this started in 2011. Um, actually, it would be nice if I could open the, we have on the website a little uh, kind of historical note, and I don't want to say the wrong name of, uh, it was suggested to NIST in 2011 that it would be a good resource for cryptography to have public randomness. And so, you know, NIST as the, as the standardization uh, 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 institute, at least in the US, would be you know uh, an appropriate uh, uh, agency to kind of suggest that and promote that. So I, I would say that uh, you know honestly, the, the I think the most direct answer is that there is a vision that public randomness is a public utility can be used for you know for the public good, and so this was a project that started as a way of uh, promoting development of randomness beacons. And it has done so by you know at this stage by promoting a reference. It's not necessarily the the you know it's not the the approach that uh, Durant follows for example and it, I, and I think overall that's good it's good that there's a diversity of things um, that's it based th does that answer the question it's it's a vision of uh, public good of being useful for the public good wonderful thank you very much thank you very much for your attention.